play-by-play uh, -play -play broadcaster for Eastern Washington University and a few other things along the, the line. Um, got into this business right out of high school. Um, I grew up uh, on a wheat farm and a cattle ranch uh, and as an only child. And so, um, and there was no kids anywhere around. Mm -hmm. So everything was done just by myself. And dad was a big sports fan. And so if I was shooting baskets in our shop or if I was throwing a rubber ball against a concrete wall to practice my pitching because there was nobody there to catch because dad was on a tractor or doing something else, um, or if I was throwing the football to myself in the backyard or whatever it was, I was doing the play-by-play -play in my head of the guys that I'd heard on the TV, and there weren't a lot of TV games in those days either, but or on the radio, he always listened to WSU games. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that in my head, and about 16 years old, I decided this would be kind of cool if I could do this for a living. And uh, my uncle, my mom's brother, lived across the street from the guy that owned the radio station in Toppenish, Washington, Yakima Valley. And they had a big tribal basketball tournament in Wapato, where there were tribes from like 14, 13, 14 states mm. that had all come to Wapato for this big, huge tournament. And uh, the owner of the radio station told uh, my uncle, he said, I don't have anybody who can do these games. My normal guy is out of town at a wedding and I'm gonna have to do these games. And my uncle told the guy, Roger Turnbow, he says, well, my nephew wants to get into this. I haven't sent me a tape. Well, he doesn't have a tape. He's never done a game. Well, he's not gonna be worse than me, so. <laughs> Right. You know, come do it, and then I did four games in two days, and he came back over on Sunday morning before I left town and said, you want to come back in the fall and do my high school games? And so that's how I got started and ended up with Eastern in 1991, and I've been with Eastern ever since. Okay, so before we get started, I just want to say this to you real quick. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you, and I, I don't know if you remember this, but I think the first time I ever met you, I was working at the Spokane Shock, and we were doing, like, mm -hmm. I was doing uh, stack keeping and stuff. I bring mm -hmm. you guys the, and I really appreciated you because you got me one of the the the, the headsets and you let me listen into like the the play call and everything and like you let me listen into or to the to your broadcast and things like that. I just really appreciated that because I was probably like fifteen year old at that time, sixteen. I'm just a young I'm sure I was super super annoying and super like oh. super starstruck and stuff. But like I just want you to know how much I appreciate you and how much you how much you mean to me and like well, thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. And that was a lot of that was Oso too, because he knew you from the radio. Yeah. Because you had called in to them. So yeah, he so knew who you were. So, you know, that helped pave the way too. Yes. So Keith is another guy that is, uh, he's great. Yeah, I love Keith. I've been um, back, at, back at KHQ now, so I can't wait to see him on a, on a call here soon. Because yeah. Because I hear that he's, that he's doing that now? He's doing well, he's, he changed jobs. He's working at uh, for Spokane Public Schools now. What? He's at New Tech Skills Center or something like that. Oh, Keith, the... Keith, Keith. Tell me what I was thinking. Oh, you're thinking Patchett. I was thinking, yeah, I was thinking you'll Dennis. see okay, Patchett at some point I've in time, seen, too. I've, yeah. seen, I've seen, yes, I did see that. And I was so surprised because I didn't think he would ever leave. Like, Or at least I thought he would go into like... I thought Keith would go to like some, some something like right. Seattle or like a, I wouldn't say a sports center, but like a sports like. Yeah. I thought he could do something. Yeah. Like, no, he's he's but he wanted to get out. So. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I just wanted you to know how much I appreciate right. you. Though. Well, I thank you for that. That's yes. very nice. But um, kind of explain where you're from, where you grew up at, um, and then we'll get into it. Okay, live grew up in a little town, uh, in the Walla Walla Valley, Waitsbury. Um. Born and raised, born in Walla Walla, raised there. As I said, only child on the wheat farm and a cattle ranch, and I knew I didn't want to do that anymore for a living. So, got out at 18 and got into the sports broadcasting and went on from there. Did you play any sports or anything when you were young? You had to in a small town. Yeah, I mean, okay. if you were capable. I had knee problems, so I didn't play football my junior or senior year, but I played basketball all four years. Played baseball my sophomore, junior, and senior year for whatever reason. I talked myself into not playing as a freshman, but I should have played. Okay. And then I played football as a freshman and a sophomore. What was your best sport that you believe? Basketball was basketball. my best sport. Yeah. What, were you, what was your what were type of player were you? I was, uh, well, we were a very tall team, okay. but we then also didn't have any guards. So uh, we were 6'6", 6'4", 6'4", 6'3", 6'3", in the oh, starting yeah, lineup, but we had no... We had no, nobody could bring the ball up the floor, so 
we get pressed and we turn it over. So I was probably, I was a decent shooter, but I was, I was more of a rebounder and shot blocker and things along those lines. Okay, where did you say you went to school at? Little town called Waitsburg. Okay, Waitsburg. Walla Walla Valley. Okay, Waitsburg, how do you spell that? W-A-I-T-S-B-U-R-G. W-A-I-T-S-B-U-R-G, wow, okay. I'm gonna have to look that up, I've never heard that before. Yeah, just that. a little tiny town, a thousand people. Okay. Um, 20 miles from Walla Walla. What was something growing up, what was a sporting event or something when you were growing up that you that you pinpoint that like really just made you like a sports fan or like when you just remember really like just really enjoying it like? You know, dad was, he was a big sports fan and so, you know, and, and a lot of times he was working, um, you know, in the field or, or whatever. So he didn't get to watch a lot of games, but he tried to listen to WSU games as much as he could. And WSU had a, a legendary broadcaster named Bob Robertson. And so I grew up listening to Bob and I, um, the only time I could get away with shushing my dad was if the game was on because I was listening to Bob very intently to where I was keeping the stats of the game. Um, and so when, if dad came in and was hollering about whatever, then I couldn't hear the game. I said, but everybody be quiet. And usually that wouldn't have worked out very well for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but but in, this, part yeah, yeah. in <laughs> this particular case, he would, okay, the yeah. game's on and he would come in he'd sit there until a you know, play had stopped or whatever. And then he'd have, okay, what's going on? And then I would give him the recap and he would go on about his business and, and go from there. So that's probably where I, Learned to do it, and Bob, okay. as I, and I had never met Bob until after I had started doing Eastern games. So he didn't know that I was, that he was my mentor, mm -hmm. um, but he was without knowing anything. And I learned later that how he learned in one of his first jobs, it was in the early 1950s and he was in Seattle. And he um, was broadcasting a game and there was a blind kid that, came to the games and he asked me, he said, can I sit next to you? Because I, you know, obviously I can't see, but I can at least hear what's happening. I don't know what's happening unless I can hear you. And so Bob said, sure. And it ended up being the best thing he ever did because then the kid would say, what do you mean when you said this or that? Mm -hmm. And so Bob, because radio is a theater of the mind. I mean, you can't, definitely. if you're listening to a game on the radio, you probably aren't watching it. So you've got to create the picture so that people can see it in their minds and having a sightless person there to question Bob on a few things, it honed his play-by-play -play to where, you know, he could, he could uh, describe it for the sighted better, I guess. Okay, what is your goal when you start a broadcast? It's from the start to the end, what are you trying to get across to people? What do you want people to understand? Or... I think we're just, you know, it's it's a game and we're having fun, but we're okay. just trying to describe the game and hopefully some there's something important about the game and it's not, you know, two teams that are one and ten or something that are playing mm -hmm. uh, one another. So you try to get across the importance of, of what's going on and, and uh, you know, have a little fun with it at the same point in time. You can't be too serious all the time. So you try to, to inject a little personality into the thing if you can and and uh, just describe what's happening out there on the field, wherever the field is, whether it's a football field, a basketball court, baseball field, whatever. Mm -hmm. Just trying to give that story. Okay, explain, give me a simple rundown on how do you keep stats at an Eastern game? How would you? The good thing is I don't have to keep stats okay. at Eastern. Well, now I take that back, because I do in basketball, I still the same way that I, uh, if I was listening to a, a WSU basketball game, I still keep stats the same way okay. as I did when I was listening to Bob Robertson. And that's, I have a, a, a legal pad, and on the left-hand side, I have everybody's name and number, and usually their scoring averages and, and things along those lines. And then I have uh, the page split in thirds. And so I have one line down and then so there's field goals here and then there's free throws over here and there's fouls over here and actually it's in, and there's a fourth line too because then I have other information on the right side of the page mm -hmm. that I need to know about. So and I just marked down, it used to be in the old days before the three point line, you just marked down a one and that would be two 
or I could have done a two, whatever, but you have a field goal, and so I just, you know, go like that, and then after five, you put the line across, and then, so it was really easy. If somebody had eight field goals and four free throws, you could see easily that it was 20 points. Yeah. Now with three-pointers, sometimes I have to sit there and that's three threes and four twos and do take it really a, you know, quick as well. Yeah, yeah. try to you know, <laughs> maybe do it during the timeout. Well, he's got 21 points now, so if he gets another three, I know what's going on, or he gets mm -hmm. another two, I know what's going on. Okay. So it's a little more difficult now, but in football, I don't keep my own stats for uh, Eastern games because they've got the computer stuff right there. When I started, though, they didn't necessarily have the computer stuff right there. So, yeah, I did my own stats. And then for high school games, I do my own stuff. But it's the same thing that I did with, with Bob when he was calling WSU games. I'd, somebody ran the ball and got seven yards, I'd put a seven by their name. And then if they ran it the next time and got a four, I'd up it to 11. I'd keep it running so I wasn't having to add seven and four and three and minus one and 14 and two and so forth. I just kept the total going across. That's how I that's how I did it, and, I, and nobody does it the way that I. Everybody has these boards and whatnot, but I never learned what a board was and, and have ever, all these things on them, and it just is unwieldy to me. I've just I've done everything with my, I memorize names and numbers, and, and, uh, and then I just write my notes and go from there. Okay, that was another question I was gonna ask you. How do you remember names? How are you so good at remembering people's like out of town? Okay, I know you. I know Eastern because you you have to yeah. say their names a lot. But like, what about out of town? Like a Sacramento or a like a team that we just in football. It's it's just time. You just have to sit there, and then you've got their depth chart, and you've got their stats, so you know who catches the ball, you know who runs the ball, you know who's tackling, you know, you know defensively who's playing. So you just go through there, and you just I just sit there for hours and we'll I'll start with running backs. And number two is, well, Sacramento State. When they were the last team that Eastern played, uh, their main running back was number four, Cameron Scadaboo. So, okay, four is Scadaboo. Then their backup to him was number nine, Marcus Fulcher. And so and I figured that out. And then I went to the third guy on the list. It was Isaiah Tau Tolliver. He was number 25. And so I and so I'd get like four running backs and then I'd go through their receivers and I'd get six or eight guys and I keep repeating and then I'll look at numbers. Number three, who's that? I'll see a three, okay, who's that? And if I can't, you know, fire back, well, three is so-and-so, then I know oh, I gotta figure out three, you know, because you, as soon as you see it, you've gotta be able to pop up with a name. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't do any good, if he's the number three caught that pass, and because everybody's nobody's like number three, right, like. nobody's got the <laughs> roster in front of them as they're listening. So uh, you've got to know who who that person is when when things happen. Um, give me what is the I'm not, okay, maybe not the greatest sporting. What is the what is the most fun? What was the best sporting event that you have covered? NCAA basketball tournament or the either the national championship football games Why? Eastern played in. Just because of the significance. Okay. I mean, you're playing for a national championship. That's a big deal. You're playing in the big dance. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen very often. Exactly. I've been doing this 32 years. Eastern's played in two championship football games and three uh, NCAA basketball tournaments. So, and one of those was COVID where there weren't very many people involved. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it just doesn't happen very often. So, those are a lot of fun and, and very memorable. Those would be five of the most important games. I, I don't know that I could... It would be hard to narrow down a list of top okay. 10 games yeah, or I something along those lines, but those would be five that would be in it. Okay. Um, I want to kind of get into a little a couple sports questions with you real quick. Uh, give me, I want to know your opinion like on the M's and kind of like their season. Um, do they need to add a bat? Do they need to add pitching? What do you, what do you think they need to do this summer to come back and actually compete next year? For I them? think, yeah, I think they've got a great... Um, nucleus in place. I mean, they're pitching. They should be set there, both as starters and in the bullpen. That wouldn't hurt to, you know, try to find another bullpen arm just because those guys, I mean, they had what Stegen Ryder that was good last year and Sadler for them both in, in 21, and neither of them, Sadler was hurt and Stegen Ryder wasn't effective this year, mm -hmm. so other people had to step in, so it wouldn't hurt them to find somebody else there. They definitely need a bat, probably two. I'd love to see them re sign Hanniger. Uh, I think he's an important cog to their team. I would love to see them sign Trey Turner from the Dodgers. Um, 
and then you either put him at short and Crawford at second or vice versa. He can mm -hmm. play second too and, and leave Crawford at short and and uh, and Turner could play second. I, I If I was doing it, he would be my first person to go after. You're doing, you're, are you anything? They, they can have whatever they want for... Yeah, I mean, they're gonna, you're gonna have to outbid in, at least in the, in the bullpen. Because Trey I mean, Turner has nothing, has no ties to Seattle, so you're going to have to be the high bid for him. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's the way it'll probably be with a lot of their hitters. You're going to have to be, you know, maybe you can, you know, get somebody. Hey, you're playing with Julio, and that'll, you know, help out a little bit. But um, they're going to have to outbid anybody for hitters because that's not a great hitters ballpark. Mm -hmm. I don't think they need to do anything starting pitching wise. Um, because they've got six guys now, I would assume somebody will be traded. Probably Flexen, um, maybe Marco. Who knows? Uh, whoever they think they can, you know, get whatever they need out of. And I think they need a left-hand hitting outfielder. They've got Kelnick, but I think they need another, another guy there just in case he. And I would let him play left field every day next year until he doesn't. Why did Marco get left off the the playoff? roster I just think he but you know in, in that you have a short series so you're not going to need five starters so you might as well have somebody else active okay. you know and, and he's not used to pitching out of the bullpen now they did that with Ray and it didn't yeah, work right. out didn't work out very well in game one serves, yeah. so you know I think you can make it that starters aren't really now Kirby did work out in Toronto he closed that that one game out in Toronto so I don't know. That's why I think Marco got left off, but I think he'll be in the rotation next year. But, you know, that's something else. In 2021, he was the number one man. Mm -hmm. He was number five this year. It, has he declined no, that much it, into it, number it, five? Davis said is okay. When you've got Gilbert and Kip Kirby, and then you trade for Castillo, and you bring in Robbie Ray, who was the Cy Young, winner in, mm -hmm. uh, Cy Young Award winner in 21. So the staff has ascended. Marco is, I mean, if, you, if he's your number five, you're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. As a starting rotation, you know, in, in your starting rotation, because he's probably a, a three or a four on most good teams' rotation. Is Judge an like a actual? Is that a fantasy, or could that actually happen? I don't know. I mean, that would be something else, wouldn't it? Him and Julio in the outfield together. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we need another outfielder, but like, I don't know if they need another outfielder either. I think the bigger concern is, is shortstop, second base. Okay. Um, but you know what? If you can get Aaron Judge, that would be a, a whale of a uh, of a deal. I just I can't imagine. I mean, I can't imagine him leaving the Yankees. I can't imagine the Yankees will be outbid, and I can't imagine he leaves. Okay. One more thing on the Mariners. What are your thoughts on like Jared Kelnick? He's an interesting guy, isn't he? I mean, he's got so much talent, but he hasn't shown it in the big leagues. He shows it when he goes down to the minor leagues, but he doesn't show it in the big leagues. So I'm not a sports psychologist or anything like that, so I don't know if he presses too hard when he gets to the big leagues or, or why he's not um, more effective in the big leagues. Now, it looked a little bit better in September than he did earlier this season, but he looked good in September last year, and everybody thought he turned the corner mm -hmm. until he got to this year. So I don't know if his head's getting in his way or, or what's getting in his way, but that's going to be a big thing for him to figure out. But I would let him play every day next year. Um, figure out if he can play or figure not. Figure out if he can play or not. And if he has a, if he hits 180 or whatever next year, then you know that you've, you know, it's time to move on. And if he hits 230 or 240 or whatever he might hit, then you know, if he's something that you think that he can keep building on that, then you keep him around. Do you think it could be like maybe a psyche thing with like Julio Rodriguez like coming up and like maybe he's seeing other people rise up and could be. I mean, that's part of why, you know, I mean, I'm not, I, 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 I don't pretend to know anything that goes on mm -hmm. inside somebody's head, but it could be a situation, whether it's Julio or somebody else, where he's just pressing. You know, he relaxes when he goes to Tacoma, but then he presses when he gets back in the league. I've got to show him what I can do. I've got to hit a home run every time up or whatever, and he's squeezing the handle of that bat into sawdust, and you got to be relaxed when you play baseball. It doesn't work when you're, you know, all tensed up. Okay. You can be tensed up in some other sports and have it work, but not in baseball. What are your thoughts on LIV competing with the, um, or like maybe coming together or whatever that situation is with LIV and the PGA? And that's, a, <laughs> that's an interesting question because, you know, I really think that Tiger Woods, I take my hat off to Woods. 
because money doesn't, I mean, he wants to stay where he is and mm -hmm. no amount of money is tradition is swaying yeah. him. He wants to be where everybody else has always played and, and that's what he has chosen to do. Other guys have chosen to, to take the, the cash from the people that might not be the best people and they'll look the other way while they're getting their, their bag of cash. Um, I mean, I, I think there's probably room for two tours. I think there's enough good players these days to, to make it to where two tours would be interesting. But as far as I know, LIV is not on television anymore. And so that could be a, a problem for them going forward if they can't land a TV deal someplace. Okay. I did not, I didn't know they were. I, and I'm not 100% sure anymore. about that, but I don't think they are. I don't believe, and I, be. I, I don't believe they have any contract, but I might be wrong. Where, where does that money come? Where does they, where do they get their money from? How do they, no, they how do they offer the Saudis was 800 million or a billion or whatever? The Saudis they say. have lots of money. They can, uh, they can pay for about whatever they want. Mm. Interesting. Um, what, what happened with the Spokane shock? What, how did that situation, how do you think it happened? Why, why did it happen? I, you know, I, that's one of the sad stories in Spokane, I think, because that thing, when it was rolling, it was something else. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was so much fun to do those games in the early days. They were superstars. It right? was, oh, those, yeah, yeah they those were, players they were, were those players were rock stars yes. in Spokane. And I mean, guys, I mean, even now, Raul Vigil has left town. He's living in the Tri-Cities, but if he were to come back for something, he would get a huge ovation you know, just because of what he did with the with the shot. Coach Shackelford still lives in town, yeah. and he's still a big deal from what he did. You know, coaching the shock, and it was just a, it was a, it, the ownership at the time, the initial ownership with Brady Nelson and those guys caught lightning in a bottle. I don't think they even dreamed that it would be as successful as it was, and. Uh, you know, they, there, there were things that happened, I think, behind the scenes that, that I'm not even aware of completely, but that probably changed some things. I think they made a mistake letting Coach Shaq go uh, when they did. You know, Rob Keefe did a great job. You can't argue about him. He mm -hmm. led the team to a championship in their first year in the AFL, up from AF2. But I think that letting Coach Shaq go hurt the team, probably from a business sense, more than anything else, because... I mean, it's hard to imagine why you let a coach go when you when in his three years you've won a championship and was runner up for another one and it's almost constant sellouts and you know you've got the best in 2009 that was the best team in the league by far they and there was so nobody so nobody good. anywhere close to those guys yes. and, and so you know I think a lot of things hurt them and then when uh, the second owner had to change the name from the shock to the empire mm -hmm. uh, after he left the AFL and went to the IFL. That, I didn't think that would be as important to a lot of people as it was, but a lot of people were married to that shock name and when the shock went away, they did too. And then I thought maybe when Sam Adams bought the team and got the shock name back, that that might bring back mm -hmm. a lot of those people, but then COVID hit. And so those people never got you know, as much of a chance to be able to go back and, and see this team. And, and by then they had had some bad publicity because of the COVID year and, and so forth, so on. So it was bad timing for Sam Adams. Um, a little bit of probably a bad timing for the second ownership too. And with the first ownership group, they probably just didn't guard it as well as maybe they should have. I don't know. I'm, I, I didn't spend a lot of time or, or enough time in the front office to really know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you're drawing 10,000 plus sellout crowds at a reasonable ticket price to see your team, now there is a lot of expenses involved from renting the arena to medical, to equipment, mm -hmm. to travel and so forth, so on. But they get sponsorship deals as well. And, and I was stunned that, um, uh, that things didn't continue to last as, you know, I mean, the AFL is gone now as well, but I'm, I'm still, I, I think it's sad that we don't have an arena team in Spokane because it fit a, a great niche. Now that we have long season baseball in Spokane, 
that long season baseball can fill the niche. But at the same point in time, do you want to go to an Indians game when it's 50 degrees and that is know, true. That in, is our, <laughs> in April and May, which was a big problem this year for them because we, we got a crappy that, spring. I did it a couple times too, and we were like, it's just too cold out there, and yeah. we're going to wait until later on in the season. So. Yeah, baseball's a warm weather sport. It's yes. hard to, to go to in the, you know, in the when it's cold outside, and, and their attendance reflected that this year. Once it got to summertime, they were drawing their big crowds again, but early in that season, they didn't have, you know, much over a thousand people at a lot of those games. Is is there room for a say if if like a team like I wouldn't say like a IFL team but let's say a team like Wenatchee or an Idaho Horseman could you maybe see a team like that maybe coming back here and maybe I think the earth has been scorched really between the last owner and and every they, with everything that happened the ownership kind of went down every you know with every group that we had uh, the first ownership group was fantastic although I think they probably would I don't know this, but I'm guessing they would do some things differently if they had to do it again. Most definitely. Um, and then the second group was, I think they, it, it just didn't work out for them being able to stay in the, the AFL. And I don't think the AFL really wanted Spokane part of their league anymore. Why is that? It was just out, you know, there was no other teams in the area. So, so it's hard to get there. It was hard to, to get yeah, to. to and, and uh, you know, attendance was, was going down at that point in time. And, you know, if, if Boise could have stayed in the league or if Seattle would have had a team or if Portland would have had a team or all of those would have had teams, that would have made it easier for Spokane and easier for the league. But, you know, Portland failed in a time or two with the AFL. Boise failed with the AF2. And Seattle never really got any traction at all. And I don't know that they really had a good place to play. They would now with Climate Pledge Arena. Mm -hmm. But I don't even think Key Arena was set up for hockey in those dumb. days yeah, so you know I, I don't think there was really a good place to play in Seattle they tried it in Everett but it was the third Spokane owner who didn't come off very well and probably didn't manage things as well as he should have in his situation here either so um, you know he kind of burned the bridges in Everett for a, a, an arena team so I just don't think now after um, a couple of failed tries that there's any appetite in Spokane, it would have to be somebody who's local, who has more money than they know what to do with, and don't care if they lose it. Mm. Why is it that the Spokane Indians and the Spokane Chiefs are so profitable, and so people eyes are drawn to them? Lower ticket prices because of more games. Okay. Um, stability in ownership, and quality ownership. The Brett Group does a fantastic job. Uh, I mean, you can just look to their partnership with the Spokane Tribe in baseball um, as to how well they run that organization. That's I worked for them in 1989 and 1990 broadcasting their games, and they were a well-run group early in their time in running those teams, and they're even better at it now because they've had so much time and they know what to do and what not to do. So that's part of it in that you have more games, so you're not having to charge as much of a ticket price. Um, there's less travel costs uh, probably involved because you're not having to get on an airplane in those leagues. You're able to travel by bus, whereas the shock had to always get on an airplane. Now there's fewer games. So in the end, ticket or the traveling might end up being something close to the same because you're traveling you know, by bus and playing 66 games on the road in baseball. So that means you've got 66 nights of hotel plus, you know, mm -hmm. buses to get people from here to there on, you know, food, all food, yeah, yeah, what, so that, you know, that might add up more there. Um, but I think it's just the, it, it uh, you know, it's an expensive ticket in the AFL or in the IFL and when you're not 100% sure of how solid the ownership is, it's a lot harder to Give your put money. out that money mm -hmm. to those people when you've got this rock solid group that's doing baseball and hockey. Yeah, they're never, amazing. Like, they've yeah, never they've screwed never, anybody out of yeah. anything. So, no, you know, I agree. Yeah. Why uh, is, could you ever see Spokane being like a double A AA or a triple A, like the Indians? You, you know, Again. yeah, if they got to the point i mean the, there is the triple a league that that covers spokane uh, you know the, the the pacific coast the pacific coast league 
Um, but I don't think that there would be a whole lot there. I don't think that, well, now that they're operating a long A, I mean, it's, there's no different to operate in triple A to a long A. I just don't know. And, and there's going to have to be improvements to that ballpark. And I, yeah, that's going to be the next thing to watch is whether the voters of Spokane County are willing to help fund improvements to that ballpark because Major League Baseball has put it forth that there has to be mm -hmm. a certain number of improvements. And if you can't um, play in a, in a stadium that has all the improvements that they mandate, then they're going to contract teams or move teams or whatever. And so when you look at the Northwest League, there aren't really any places that right now qualify to, to, to being up to standard according to the major leagues and, and what they want. So these Local governments are going to have to figure out whether they want to put a lot of money into this. Major League Baseball is not going to help, which is ridiculous. But you know what? They don't. I, I was amazed they allowed a union for the minor league players. So you know, I, 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 it's it's the next few years of baseball in Spokane will be interesting. Will we be able to continue on? And even if Spokane votes to make the improvements, will other communities do the same? Okay, so what does that mean for the future of, because I can guarantee that there's gonna be at least one or two cities that are not going to want to put that money forth that aren't gonna have maybe the, the big of base that Spokane has. Does that change the way that, does what happens at that point? Yeah, well, like, that, the league is probably contracted at that point, and they just, I, I, I really think where we're headed, especially at the single A level, where Spokane is, is complex baseball, where teams will be playing at their minor league, you know, complexes in Arizona, and you'll play at nine in the morning, and there won't be any fans, but you won't have the expense that you have probably with the minor league franchise. I think that's a danger because in this league, Eugene, they need a ballpark mm -hmm. because the University of Oregon doesn't want them there. That ballpark fits probably a lot of what minor league baseball wants, but it's Oregon's field. They don't. <laughs> they don't want those guys there. Why not? Why do they do they not? Because it the, the the season now overlaps with Oregon, uh, so they don't even want to share. They don't even want yeah. to take those. So they don't want to have to deal with that. So if there's a six week at least overlap, and then if you make the college baseball playoffs and the World Series, there's a two month overlap. Mm -hmm. So the or University of Oregon doesn't want it. So the voters of that area, whether it's the city of Eugene or their county, they need to vote on a new ballpark, and that's going to be expensive. And a Eugene lot more expensive. That money, like yeah, that's the, just it. The Everett. Taxpayers. Everett plays at a, at a facility that's that's uh, a school district facility. You're kidding. So they don't have the clubhouses. They don't have they don't have hardly anything. So they need a, a new ballpark or tremendously expensive upgrades that nobody's going to pay for. Why is it that Everett has no like as as a Mariners organization? I feel like they they are they're single A long or long season Mariners, right? Yeah. Okay. Why isn't it that they don't have those things that they need? Because I feel like they have they have Tacoma. Tacoma has their right. That well, the major play. league teams aren't aren't paying for it, so it's got to be up to the people of the community. And I don't know whether the people in Tacoma tax themselves to provide the upgrades at the stadium there, or whether that's just over time they knew they had to do that and they took it. A little bit at a time to, to bite it off and whereas Spokane and, and Everett and Eugene and Hillsboro and Tri-Cities and Vancouver they don't have a lot of time they have three four years to try to get up to to you know to speed on this whereas mm -hmm. Tacoma may have been working on things for 20 years and doing a million here and a million there and a million somewhere else or maybe two million another time um, whereas it's going to be 15 or 20 million for Spokane <laughs> and it's going to be probably that amount for the Tri-Cities and probably close to that amount for Vancouver, maybe not quite that amount for them, but it'll be close and Eugene and, and Everett are probably looking at 40, 50, 60 million dollars. Why is it that they need that much, at least for the Indians? Cause I always felt like the Indians had a really nice, like very up-to-date kind of for, the, for minor league baseball, I always felt like it was really, really nice. There's a lot of infrastructure stuff that needs to be done. You've got to have, uh, they've got to increase their locker rooms. They've got to increase their size of their dugouts. They have to have a dining facility. They have to have additional dressing rooms for uh, like female trainers or 
other people, that, if there's a female member of the coaching staff or whatever it might be, you've got to have more places for all these people. So there's got to be a lot of that type of work done. They need to, I think they're going to completely replace their field. If I remember right, um, they have to improve the infrastructure as far as wireless and wired uh, internet communications. I would not be at all surprised if they had to do something at some point in time with their press box situation. Mm -hmm. Expanding that or increasing that in some way. Um, there's just a lot of things that, that uh, improve the lighting. So the, there's, they're going to have to do something different with the, with the light poles as far as you know, making it uh, uh, and, and you're in television and, and I am around television some, but I don't know what the, 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 the name, but there's a, a lighting level that you have to have to make it look good on TV. Yes. And there's a name for it. I don't know what the name I is. I can tell you what the name is, but um, uh, Jake was just, we were just, that's crazy, because there's a certain lens that we have to put on from at the Gonzaga game because of, I forget what it's called right now. But. Yeah, so, that's, so there's a lighting standard that has to be upheld as well, and, and they're out of, out of uh, commission on that. So there's gonna be, you know, 15, 20 million dollars probably in the end of the, by the time you build things and expand dugouts. I mean, what do you do to expand a dugout? You've got to, you know, you're going to have to, that's going to be a lot of work to, to try and make that bigger and make the clubhouses bigger. And it's going to be, it's, there's a lot of work involved there and, and uh, it's expensive work. And then if you're building a whole new ballpark, obviously that's going to be a, a huge expenditure for the communities that, that need to do that. And that's basically Eugene and Everett. So. We'll see what happens. I'm, it's going to be very interesting to see. And will Major League Baseball back down off that? There's some people who think that they're going to just contract teams until uh, they have Double A AA and Triple A, and and you know everything else goes away. So what, what what happens to the talent pool though? I feel like that would take away from. Uh... Yeah, everybody would stay in the complexes and get you know their spring training complexes and get instruction there, and, and they go home and work out or. No, they'd play games there. Oh, they would just they just they like utilize their spring training. Like... No, they'd utilize their spring training facilities because all those fields uh, that, that they play yeah. spring training ball in, they're not used. Now it's 140 degrees in Arizona. It's hyperbole, but it's really hot there. But you, you play at nine in the morning. Yeah, and you get the game done by noon. You, you, there's no TV or radio for it. You don't have to to do a two or three minute commercial break every half inning. Yeah, you just you know get on the field, get off the field. Warm up, go, do, boom. There's no screwing around. And with mm -hmm. with the, the, the pitch clock now that they've put into minor league baseball where you have, you know, 14 seconds to deliver a pitch if nobody's on or 18 if somebody is on, it's a quicker game anyway. So you could probably, you'd be done by noon in a lot of those games there. If you start at 9 in the morning and then you can have instruction in the afternoon, you can have instruction some in the morning, but that would be mostly getting guys loose, batting practice, Mm -hmm. What not, and then you can have instruction in the afternoon, go through the film, do other things, and then send everybody home with dinner at 5 and lights out at 9.30 or 10 or whatever, and you're up at 6, and you do it again the next day. Mm -hmm. And there would be a cost to that for major league teams, but I don't know that it would be as much of a cost oh, definitely much cheaper. Yeah. As, as it would be to, to host these kids in communities and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be interesting. I hope that minor league baseball stays intact, but they're already contracted. Mm -hmm. 80, 68, if 60 franchises or 40 franchises or 80 franchises or whatever it was, I don't think it would be anything for minor league baseball to, or major league baseball to contract another, you know, what, 60 or whatever mm -hmm. from, from the minor leagues as well. Yeah. Especially if there's a lot of these communities that don't have suitable facilities, according to minor league baseball. I think the California League would have to make a lot of changes in what they do as well. So. You know, that would take care of all the baseball on the West Coast other than the Pacific Coast League. That is, that is, that's so sad. That's crazy. Um, what are your thoughts, one more question. What, is your, what are your thoughts on the NCAA and realignment, conference realignment and everything right now? With like teams going to the SEC, Big 12, what does that mean for like a school like Gonzaga or like a school like maybe Eastern that is on that fringe of where Eastern is a sub D1 school or whatever, but they're still like, I don't know what the... Yeah, so... What does that, what does that mean? So in football, Division One is split into two levels. There's the football bowl subdivision, which is 85 scholarships, and it's the big schools that you see on TV every week, Pac-12, yes. 
ACC, Big 12, Big 10, and Southeastern Conference. And then you've got the second subset in the FCS, or FBS, which is the Group of Five, which is the Mountain West, the American Athletic, the Mid-American Conference, the Sun Belt, and Conference USA. And then you have FCS, which is 63 scholarships rather than 85. And with the 85 scholarship schools, everybody gets a full scholarship. At the 63 scholarship level, everybody can get a full scholarship, but then you're limited to 63. So you can have 85 guys on scholarship, it's just they're splitting 63 total scholarships. So you might have 50 guys on full scholarship and then 35 guys splitting the other 13. So you've got the three levels, the Power Five, the Group of Five, and the FCS. And what's happening is the Group of Five is falling closer to the FCS than they are being able to keep up with the Power Five. Um, it's just a money war at this point in time. It's all has to do with money and TV is the main player mm -hmm. in the money war. So uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see whether there is further uh, right now, from the all looks of it, is the Pac-12 will survive, whether it's with 10 or, or whether they go back to 12. Yeah. Um, and it looks like the other, so I don't know that there'll be any further, there will probably still be a couple of, you know, defections from one conference to another, like we had with UCLA and USC this past year. Uh, but I don't think, I think most of the big realignment is done. I think Notre Dame's the next shoe to fall. Will they join a conference or will they try to stay independent? Uh, with Gonzaga, I don't think it affects them a whole lot because they're not playing football. Um, they just don't have a whole lot of options for their basketball. I've always thought that schools like San Diego State and New Mexico and UNLV and uh, some of those schools would see the light trying to, to chase the Power Five and they decide to put all their money into basketball, but there's still so much money out there, even if you're a Group of Five school, that um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense just to go into a basketball-centric league, because I thought there might be something that would be Big East type thing in the West, where you'd have BYU, Gonzaga, St. Mary's, Boise, San Diego State, New Mexico, UNLV, and a couple of other schools, and you might get a league where you'd have four or five NCAA bids out of that. But even if you did have a league with four or five NCAA bids, it still doesn't equal the football money. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I just don't think there's a lot of options for Gonzaga. I don't think joining the Mountain West is a, is a real option for them. I don't think the Big East is a real option for them. Pac-12 is not an option. Pac-12 is not an option for them. Um, so I think they're in the West Coast Conference, and which took us a hit without BYU when BYU left. So, you know, Gonzaga's got an interest. I think they would be willing to listen um, if somebody came to them with some kind of a proposal, but I just don't think that, you know, if you leave to the Mountain West, I don't think that that league is going to get many more bids than yeah, the I WCC. Be the than the WCC. Yeah, to and be you'd be forfeiting the last however many years of TV money, six years of TV money that you earned because the West Coast Conference isn't gonna let you have that mm -hmm. if you're leaving the conference. So you're sacrificing all that TV money for a conference where you probably aren't going to see a lot more TV money or a lot more NCAA money. Mm -hmm. So I think Gonzaga is in a bad spot. As far as Eastern is concerned, I don't think that all this going on is going to affect Eastern any at all unless the Montanas decide that they're going to go, deep go or wherever deep else, deep. or they're going to go to FBS, or there's been a lot of the talk of a power uh, FCS league with the Dakota schools and the Montanas and, you know, factor in a couple of other schools in there. There's been talk about that happening. Um, I don't know how, more, how, how involved the talks are, but there's been some speculation that maybe that's something that would be of interest to those schools. And if Montana stay in the big sky, if Montana and Montana State stick around, um, as long as Eastern and their uh, administration doesn't uh, pull back the money that's being given to athletics right now, I think the Big Sky will stay the same. I think Eastern will stay the same and they'll be competitive at their mm -hmm. FCS level in football and they'll be competitive at the conference level in basketball and we'll see how much further they can get beyond being competitive at the conference level in basketball.
Okay, two things real quick. What do you think of the college football playoff with them expanding it right now? I'm to, in, amazed in they let the, I am amazed they let the group of five have a seat at the table still. I thought they would take that money and hoard it among themselves. So I'm very surprised that that they let one of the group of five schools have a, a seat at the table. Um, and, and I, I, I think that I think twelve is a tough number. I'm surprised they didn't go to either eight or sixteen, because in a lot of cases buys don't really help. I mean, we saw we saw that in the baseball playoffs, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Houston made it through, but both the teams in the National League that came off the buys, the Braves and the Dodgers, they didn't make it through yeah. the buy. Well, arguably, Mariners should be. And sometimes in the in the FCS playoffs, they have 24. The top eight seeds get buys. Sometimes those buys lose in the first game uh, because they've had a week off instead of continuing to play. Doesn't happen a lot, but it happens some. Um, so I'm surprised they didn't go with just a set number, either eight or 16. And then you have, you know, four games or eight games, whatever it is, and you, you know, go go from there as far as working with bowls and whatnot to. Uh, you know, for those games to be the play-in games for the national championship game uh, in the end. So we'll see what happens. Um, I think it's good for the Pac-10. I think that helped save the, the Pac-10, Pac-12, whatever they're going to be, mm -hmm. because their champion is guaranteed a spot. So now Oregon, Washington, Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, Utah, whoever was thinking of leaving before, they've got to stop now. Okay, do we have a better chance of getting into this tournament from the Pac-12, Pac-10, or do we have a better chance if we go to the Big 12, Big 10, mm -hmm. whatever other conference they're in? And I'd say probably not would be the answer to that. So I think they'll all stay together, especially if the Pac-12 can figure out a way to, to carve a little bit more out of the media pie and, and get a little bigger uh, slice. And I've talked to some people who think they're going to I think they're getting something like 30 million a school now if they could get 40 to 45 in the next deal. So mm -hmm. if they get that, that's gonna make it a little harder and, and you, the, your champion has a, has a bad, you know you're gonna have at least one team in the playoffs. I think it's gonna make it harder for schools to leave. Mm -hmm. I, I have a problem with like how, with the 14 playoff, just because of, I feel like the competition, I heard um, Jared Clapp, Clack or something like he's on Fox News or Fox Sports. He's always on Colin Cowherd and stuff. But um, he talks about the competition. Like the he said something about the sixth ranked team UCLA has the exact same talent as a UAB, and that was like seventy two overall. And that is why all these teams are able to the these lower teams that we don't think are as good. That's why they have been beating these other teams because the competition level is a little bit more even than we think. But I just have a problem with, I just feel like everybody wants to go to Alabama and everybody wants to go to Georgia, everybody wants to go to Clemson, which I don't even know why you want to go to Alabama or like, I'm sure there's probably amazing things about them, but like, I, I'd really, if, I, if I was a kid, I'd rather go to USC or like a UCL, something that's like flashy, that's nice, that's like you're, so I, I don't know, I think it would be nice to have a different, I'm a Nebraska fan too, so right. that would, I think it would make things more competitive because it would bring people it'd be more I think it's like the NIL and stuff as well but I think it'd be more about who's offering the most money and stuff at that point like, right yeah I mean that's that's what it's all about at that level man is yeah. the money it's it's all about the cash and you know eastern Washington went to Florida a couple of weeks ago three weeks ago to play football and uh, you know that game was uh, as it ended out up Gainesville did not get hit by Hurricane Ian, but if they had, they were still going to play that game because they didn't want to. to they sold eighty thousand tickets to it, or whatever. They didn't want to refund millions of dollars mm -hmm. to ticket holders. So they wanted to play that game, and Eastern needed to play that game because they were getting paid to be there, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, which was roughly five percent of the school budget for athletics. So they couldn't afford to not play the game. So the game was going to get played. That's why they moved it to Sunday to make sure that it could be played. So money runs everything in athletics. Um, it's just a matter of who's going to get a, a, you know, are the athletes going to keep getting a piece of the pie? Or are they going to find a way to wedge them out somehow? How's it going to, how's it all going to work? There's still a lot of things that have to play out in this whole thing. Last thing real quick, uh, I'll keep it super short. Eastern is, what is, what's going on this season? Is it, are they young? What's, is the, do they need, are they missing some pieces? I just, uh, why isn't it the, 
the the normal Eastern that I think we remember. Like I feel like when they went to Oregon, I just felt like they were gonna. I, I, when when every year that I Vernon Adams with um what's the old boy from EJ or, or whatever his name was like. Eric Berrier, just, yeah, yeah, Eric, yeah. Yes, Eric Berrier. Like I just always knew Eastern probably was not going to win, but they were going to put up a hell of a fight, and they were gonna they could win or. But they were going to keep it right. Yeah. Well, they, they you know they beat Washington State in 2016. They beat Oregon State in 2013. They beat UNLV in 2021. It was just a ridiculously tough schedule this year mm -hmm. because Oregon was pretty good, Florida is pretty good, and then they played right now as of today the two, three, and five ranked teams in FCS football. So um, you know those teams, those three teams, Montana State, Weber State, Sacramento State, have lost one game combined. That was Montana State to to Oregon State. Uh, Sacramento State beat Colorado State, Weber State beat Utah State, and they just didn't beat them, they beat them bad. They whooped them. Like four or five touchdowns each. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's ridiculously tough schedule. Um, and, you know, the, they had to replace, I mean, you can't replace Eric Berrier. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was the best quarterback in the country last for year. I'm stunned. For a couple that, years. That, yeah. I think I'm, for a couple of years he was the I'm best. stunned he didn't get a chance in the NFL. Um, he's playing with Michigan in the USFL right now. I, you know, hopefully he balls out there and gets a chance to, to play because I, I, I was stunned that nobody even off, uh, finally Denver brought him in to, mm -hmm. for a workout, for a workout. Yeah, I, I mean, they that. didn't even sign him as a free agent. So, I mean, the guy's got a strong arm. He's elusive. His mechanics are a little funny. I understand that, but. They said the exact same thing about Vernon Adams. And I think Vernon Adams is probably the best quarterback to come through Eastern. And probably one of the top Oregon quarterbacks, probably in the last like. I feel bad 10, for Vernon because if he, he was be stayed in, healthy in 2015. He should be in the league. He everything would have changed for him, um, but not being able to stay healthy hurt him that year. Um, and so with Eastern, I think it's just a, a, a combination of the ridiculously tough schedule. They lost a few guys that are very hard to replace. Um, and then as far as the coaching staff, they lost both their coordinators. So they had to go out and get new coordinators and it takes time for everybody to get on the same page. Mm -hmm. And I just think that all those things combined has really hurt them um, this season. They don't have a Cooper Cup and they don't have a Eric Berrier and they don't have some of these dynamic playmakers, but they've got a lot of really good players and they've done some really good things this year. Consistency has probably been the other thing that's hurt them a little bit. They play well for a half and then they don't play well for a half or they play well for a quarter and then not so well and then they play well again and then they you know mm -hmm. both the Weber State game and Sacramento State games they were tied 21-21 and things went south from there so they've got to figure out also how to have a 60 minute game not a 20 or a 32 minute game or whatever it might be. Okay. Is it realistic for me being a Nebraska fan to think we could get Urban Myers? I don't know why you'd want Urban Myers. Well because I want to win. Yeah, but it, I mean, there's uh, there's there's been, uh, there are a lot of the coaches that can get you wins, other than having to to do a dance with a guy. Well, like that. I hear you. I hear you. I, <laughs> I, I I I don't like the dude. I don't like his. I don't like his what he does on his personal time and what he does. But like, I like to win, and I'm all about. I'm I'm all for having one or two tough press conferences. If that's what there's there's a lot of coaches out there that can win you football games. They just got to figure out who it is and and pay them enough money to to to. You know, make the jump from wherever they are. Okay. Um, you know, you look at a team like the, the New York Giants this year in the NFL. They brought in, I don't even know what the guy's name is, but here they are. Four and one. Four, four and one, five and one, yeah, whatever they are. And, yeah. and I mean, that guy's everybody's saying, well, he's coach of the year. Well, I'll bet you 90% of the people didn't even know who the heck he was before I the. Still don't. Yeah, yeah. before the, the, the season even started. And there's other people doing big things at other places. It's just there's always a stigma that. If you're not doing something at power five level, then you're not capable of doing it because somebody else would have brought you in if you were. Yeah. So, you know, I think that there's some guys at that group of five level and there's some guys at the FCS level um, that are pretty dang good, you know, pretty dang good coaches and deserve the opportunity. Bo Baldwin. Yeah. Tremendous coach. Deserved an opportunity at that level. For years, and I don't he, know if he's ever he going to do, get that opportunity. So. You know, he's it's, so there are guys out there that deserve the opportunity and would win if they had the opportunity. But you know, these guys have to win their press conferences too. So, an Urban Meyer would win a press conference, you know, and all the fans would be fired up. But you know, you 
hear you. It didn't work in Jacksonville, and, there, yeah. and, and they were being as, as nice to him as, as anybody could be. Yeah. So I, I just don't think it's going to work, whether it's at Arizona State. There's some people that want to bring him down there or at Nebraska or anywhere else. And there's some other guys like that, too, that are in that same boat. So it'll be, uh, you know, I, 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 I think there's some guys out there that can win at Nebraska. They, just, you know, they thought Scott Frost would win. I thought Scott Frost would do well at Nebraska. Yeah. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough at that level to make the right hire. Uh, it's tough at any level to make the right hire. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens there. Give me some, somebody that's like maybe like 18, kind of growing up, maybe going off to college or maybe just getting out of college. What are some good budgeting ideas or things that they can save money in? Well, that's there a good question because I haven't been 18 in a long time. That's so, you know, it's, it's a lot different now than it was, you know, well, back in the stone age at that level. Um, what I would say is you just got to kind of figure out what it is that you can do and how much money you can make. I mean, school is so, it's so expensive these days that it's, you know, I, I, I don't know how kids are doing it, to be honest with you. I mean, in the old days, you could work, you know, your summers where I came from, everybody worked in the cannery or they worked in the wheat harvest or they worked in uh, whatever it might be agriculturally and they could make enough money over the summer to be able to pay their tuition and you know have a place to live and and uh, you know maybe you'd have to work a few hours a week or something like that during the school year but you could make ends meet but now it's so expensive to go to college uh, I don't know I don't know that I have anything good that I can tell people other than you know watch what you have coming in and make sure that you don't have more going up than you have coming in I like that <laughs> And that sounds like a key to success right there. I like that. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of the, you know, you just got to watch it. And, and, and education is important. I will say that as well. But the other thing you got to do at 18 is you got to try to find what it is that you want to do. And the easy thing is, it sounds easy. You, be, you, you need to find a job where going to work every day isn't a chore where you love what you're doing. I mean, right now all I do is broadcast games. So I don't, I got rid of all the crap that you have to deal with on a daily basis at a radio station. And now I just get to do what I enjoy doing. It's, it's my hobby, it's, it's fun, it's, there's no real pressure. You just, you wanna sound as good as you can because you don't wanna sound worse than you did, you know, in previous years. So if you can find a job and a career that is what you love to do, and I think the old saying is, if you, uh, if you, if it doesn't seem like you're working for a living, then you're probably doing okay because mm -hmm. you're doing something that you really love. But you know, if you're a, a person that's good with your hands, then find, you know, a, a electrician or a, a mechanic or plumbing or whatever it might be if that and you don't have to go to a four-year school you just have to get experience in that field uh, if you're good with numbers go get into accounting or or you know some field that will allow you to use your numbers and the things you like to do if you're good at something else go find something that will correspond with that and if you don't know what you're doing then go out and experience a bunch of things and See if you can find what you like and go from there. Mm -hmm. um, that's the toughest thing I think for kids these days is to try to find a career that you like um, that pays enough money to be able to, to live at the end of the day and and you know mm. be able to enjoy what you're doing. So it's a lot different than it was 40 years ago. I'll tell you that. Okay, give me some. How can someone build strong relationships or strong bonds with? their loved ones or friends. I'm probably the worst guy to ask about that because again, I grew up as an only child uh, with no kids around. So there was no kids within three miles of where I lived. So, and in the summertime, I mean, every, there was jobs to be done. We had cattle, so they had to be fed in the morning, they had to be fed in the evening. Uh, sometimes those cattle escaped their pens. We had to go chase them. Uh, so we had varying fen uh, pasture land and so if, if we had cattle in this pasture over here, then maybe in this pasture we needed to go fix fence. And so, you know, even at 10 and 11 and 12 years old, I was out there fixing fence because that was something that I could do. I didn't have to lift a 100 pound bale of hay or whatever it was that I wasn't capable of, but I could go out there. I could take a hoe and go hoe weeds out of the garden or hoe weeds out of a field or 
do whatever at that age. So we all, there was only three of us. Some years when it was good, we had a, a hired hand, but in other years where wheat prices or cattle prices were down, we didn't. And then it was mom and dad and, and me. So, um, you know, we, we it, I didn't really have a tremendous amount of interpersonal relationships growing up. And so um, the one regret that I have in my business is I didn't, stay in contact with the people that I, you know, worked with. So when I was doing Spokane Indians games, Bruce Bochy was the manager in, in 1989 in, in Spokane. Well, Bochy went on to be San Diego Padres manager, then was San, Diego, or San Francisco Giants manager, won however many, three, four World Series, whatever it was with the Giants. Bochy came back to Spokane this year because he worked with the Giants and he came in to watch uh, you, you, the, the Giants team in, in the Northwest League was Eugene and so Boach was in for a series I hadn't seen him in 30 years but I let that I mean he could have helped me Kevin Towers was the pitching coach in 89 and 90 in Spokane and and Towers went on to be the general manager of the Padres and general manager of the the Arizona Diamondbacks Towers probably could have helped me if I'd stayed in constant contact with him and mm -hmm. and really worked on those relationships but I kind of come and go and <laughs> I don't really, I, I, I leave very little footprint and I would prefer not to be noticed and I would prefer not to be seen. I, I like being heard when people want to listen to what I have to say, but I would rather be, um, you know, a fly on the wall or somebody in the, in the back of the, of the room watching and observing. Um, if you have a personality that is outgoing um, and you are, uh, uh, somebody who, who is good at relationships, then just cultivate the relationships. Cultivate whether it's personal or whether it's professional. Um, keep in contact with people that you've worked with, um, people that you've met on the way up. Um, I enjoy helping out young broadcasters as much as I can. Um, but, you know, there aren't as many broadcasting jobs as there were in the day for guys to cut their teeth. My first broadcasting job in Toppenish, Washington, that radio station exists, but it's owned by the Yakima tribe mm. and they don't do any high school games. They don't even, it's not even a commercial radio station. It's just a radio station for the tribe to, to play um, their native music or get their native language programming, that kind of stuff going on. So they don't do anything along those lines. Um, you know, a lot of the stations that we're in that same league down there. A lot of those stations don't broadcast games anymore either. So there aren't as many opportunities for young broadcasters to get reps and to get experience. And so I try to help guys out as much as I can, but it's a lot harder business now mm. to get into than it was in the old days. But uh, if you get back to your original question, just if you're, if, if you're a, a person like me, then you're probably screwed. But if you're a, per if you're a normal person, that values interpersonal relationships and, 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 and interacts with people well, um, cultivate those relationships, whatever they are, whether your personal or your professional relationships, stay in contact with those people, um, make it more than an email or a text, you know, call them, go see them. Voice is better than voice or face, mm -hmm. a lot better than something that's impersonal like an email or a, or a text. Um, call people and, and, and tell them you love them and tell them you respect them, tell them whatever it is you need to tell them, but tell them, don't, you know, and don't put it off because that's the other thing. I mean, we know, we, none of us know how much time we have here, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people who are mentors in my life are gone and I wish I would have told them, um, you know, how much of a mentor they were to me. And a lot of those people I didn't because... You know, I tend to go hide in the corner, so. I hear you. <laughs> I like that. That was a great, uh, that was a great explanation. I appreciate you. Um, one last thing. Give me your definition of success. What is your, like, when you, when you complete this, you feel like you're like, that's, you're successful. Like, what is it? I think that varies with everybody. But for me, I think w what I would say is, are you happy? And if you're happy, then you're successful. If you have, if you're content with your living situation, if you're content with your family situation, if you're content with your employment situation, if you're content with your extracurricular activity, your hobbies, whatever that is, if you're happy, 
then you must be doing okay. Mm -hmm. So I would guess that you're successful at that point. I mean, some people might put it on how much money you have. Other people might put it on how, how what's your car. Other people might put it on what's your house. I would just say, if you're happy, then you must be doing pretty well because there's a lot of unhappy people out there. Um, and I think that's because they're in bad relationships or they're um, not happy with their job or they're not happy with their life in some way. So if you're happy, then you're probably a success. I like that. That was another good one right there. I really appreciate you. That's, um, I always, I always try to think about that. I, that's like one of my biggest like things that I try to think about every day is what is the definition of success? Cause it changes every single day for me. Like it's always like, I'm always one day I'm like, Oh yeah, this was a super successful day. But then the next day I'm like, Ooh, like, but then I'm like, Oh, okay. This day is super successful. Like well, even then, better than the last. One. Right. Like, Not every day is going to be. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 the main thing is you win more than you lose, right? So if you have more successful days than you have, I mean, some days are just going to be crap. That's just the way it is. You're going to step in the mud puddle or you're going to tear your pants or you're going to, you know, whatever. Something's going to go wrong. Almost definitely. But if you have more days where, okay, well, that didn't really... There's, there's a, a guy named uh, Ray Wiley Hubbard who is a singer and he's kind of a... I don't know what you, he's, he's got some blues in him, he's got some country in him, he's got some southern rock in him. Uh, but he has a song called Mother Blues. And the last, last line of Mother Blues is, the days where I can keep my gratitude higher than my expectation, I have a really good day. Mm. So keep your gratitude higher than your expectation and you'll probably have a really good day. And then you're, if, if you have a bunch of good days in a row, then I think you're having a successful time of it in life. Life is hard to navigate, man. Life's really hard to navigate. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep your mental health high by keeping that gratitude high and keeping your expectations of what people owe you and what you are owed and what you deserve and so forth, and keep that a little lower, then chances are you'll have better days and lead to more success and better mental health, in my opinion. Okay, last thing real quick. If Larry could have a billboard, what would be on it? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, that's a good... I never thought of that before. You know what? Just because I would rather be in a... Lost in a... If I'm in a crowded room, I'll be in the corner. I would probably have... My billboard would have something to do with, you know, go see an Eastern Athletics game or something along those lines because that's the longest relationship in my life has been <laughs> with Eastern Athletics. So uh, it would probably say something of, hey, come to the game or, you know, or donate to the program or whatever it might be. It wouldn't be, you know, or, or, or maybe I could put the, the Ray Wiley, uh, you know, keep your gratitude higher than your expectations. Maybe I'd put that up on the, on the billboard. Well, I think I think that might be the worst relationship because that that's a that's a give and take relationship that just t does a whole bunch of taking and not much giving sometimes. I feel like, and that's my that's how I feel as like a Mariners fan sometimes. And like, I I was very disappointed with the Mariners. I was I was sad for like a day. Like a day. I mean, it was tough because yeah. they you know they should have won Game One and you mm -hmm. know they kind of frittered that away. And and then if you just you had seventeen innings, just score one stinking run. Yeah. Right, just one. It did, they didn't have to score five or eight or fourteen. They just had to get one across, one. So yeah, I mean, and and that's one thing that the broadcasting has kind of done with me. It's beaten any fan out of me, because as a broadcaster, I mean, I if people if if they listen to me doing an Eastern game, they know that I'm the Eastern Washington radio announcer. Yeah, we want Eastern so to win. I want Eastern to win. Yeah. But at the same point in time, I'm going to give the other team credit if they. Mm -hmm. Make better plays. This is what always bugs me about Montana. All right, so now you've got me started here. This uh, always bugs hey, me about I'm, Bobby Howe. I'm a cat, so you just you just, just be careful where where. So he, it, it, Bobby never gives credit to the other team. It's yeah. always his team did this wrong. Or his yeah. team did that wrong. Isn't the other guys did something wrong? I mean, his team didn't. The, the reason they did something wrong is probably the other guys did something better. Mm -hmm. And so I just like one time for it come out of his mouth. And if he ever sees this or hears this, he'll probably be wondering, oh, I can give you 14 different things, but I haven't seen it. 
um, where he gives the other team credit for beating them. Idaho this past weekend beats them, and it was, well, we did, they just got to catch a snap on a punt to, to, you know, that turned into a safety, or we've yeah. got to do this, and we've got to do that, or we didn't do that, and it was not that, hey, Idaho played a hell of a game. Mm -hmm. Give them credit, tip of the hat. That's one thing I love about Aaron Best and Bo Baldwin before him. They give the other team credit when the other team beats them. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe there were some things that their team could have done better, but they always give the other team credit because part of the reason why Eastern didn't do something very well was because the other guys did whatever it was better than, exactly. than Eastern was able to execute their plan. So Idaho did stuff that was better than Montana, but Hauk didn't give Idaho any credit. He chose to focus on his guys, and, and that's something that's always bothered me. So Take responsibility. Take responsibility, yeah. yes, and, and, and give credit to other people. Sometimes yeah. somebody's going to do something better than you, and maybe you learn from that. And it's not such an ego thing, I guess, or whatever. I don't know whether the ego thing is, is quite the right deal there. But it just, it's, you know, other people are doing things at high levels too. So if you get beaten, then give credit to them. And that could be going to be a deal with job interview or whatever it might be. Maybe you go in there and, and you think you've aced the interview, but you lose the deal. Well, it's not the fault of the employer or whatever. It's just somebody else may have come in and, Giving them something better than what you did, even what, though what you did was very good. So, and, and that'll help save somebody some angst and, and you know, stomach acid and whatnot mm -hmm. that might come off of, you know, grinding your teeth over, you know, well, I did, I nailed that and I didn't, well, whatever it might be. Well, maybe somebody just came in and outperformed you. Yeah, you lost. Might not have been anything to you that you did wrong. Yeah. It's just somebody came in and did something better. Like a, a, a you know, the, the, the track and field to me is always the, the, the toughest sport because you train all year long and in the end you come to your conference meet and if you have a bad meet, you might have the top mark in the conference all year long. You might have, you ran a 10-500 or whatever it might be or you threw the shot 70 feet or whatever it is. It's high jump 7 feet, but on that day you high jump 6-6. Six, six. You're still probably the best high jumper in the conference, mm -hmm. but you didn't win. But you still performed, you had a great year, but you still didn't win. And you don't get a chance to go to the next level. And you don't, that's always been just a brutal sport to me because you could be the best guy all year long and then you get to the one final meet and you pull your hamstring or you're mm -hmm. guilty of a false start or you just aren't feeling good that day and you just don't run your best race or you don't throw your best mark or you don't jump the, the highest or the furthest or whatever it is. I never understand how those people can, because I would just tear me up. But that's where you just have to, hey, I'm still, somebody beat me today. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't perform to my best. Or maybe you gave it your best and somebody, and maybe you had that seven foot high jump, but somebody jumped seven one. Mm -hmm. Or you had the 25 foot long jump. Somebody jumped 25 feet and a half inch. So sometimes you just have to tip your cap to the opposition. We used to be really, uh, I wouldn't say jealous was the right word, but track and field athletes, they're gone. They're out of school so much. So my face to be <laughs> tests. It's always around test time. It's always like when we got to go do something like a class, like a group project. Track athletes because they got indoor during the during the beginning of the year, and they got outdoor during the after that. You yeah. must be really jealous of the of the, of the track athletes. So yeah, they get they to, got it nice, right? They they would have a full year of stuff where you'd only have three months or whatever mm -hmm. it was, you know. Yeah. So I really appreciate you, Larry. Nice to be done. That means a lot. Yeah. Appreciate you, man. Yeah.